Okay. We are live uh, on YouTube. Good evening, everybody. If you haven't already, if you're just joining us, please make sure you shut your videos off now. Um, and, and don't be offended if your video accidentally comes back on later and I, I uh, shut it off myself. So um, it helps things go a little bit smoother when, when we can only see the videos of the presenters. I'm going to turn my own video off here in a minute, actually. Uh, as I said just a second ago, this session is live and being recorded. Welcome to the fourth installment of Kentucky Fish and Wildlife's Spring Turkey Field to Fork webinar series for 2021. Uh, remember, this information that we have is, is geared towards the absolute beginner. So uh, don't feel self-conscious if you have never been turkey hunting before like myself or never, um, never called a turkey or don't have a clue what equipment <coughs> equipment uh, that you uh, need for turkey hunting. This is, a, this is exactly where you need to be. If, you, if you're the absolute beginner, this is the right place. Uh, if you're just joining us on Zoom, uh, make sure you please put your name and where you're from in the chat, and that's going to help us later on almost as much as uh, – the survey that we're going to send you tomorrow, if you could fill that out, that helps us even more. So I'd really appreciate it if you could do that. Uh, make sure you keep your cameras off, keep your microphones muted unless we ask you to come back on. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, let's see. I am Brent McCarty. I'm an R3 specialist for the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife, and I have the pleasure of introducing our two um, presenters today. We're going to talk about turkey hunting equipment, everything you need to be out in the field turkey hunting. I'm really looking forward to this because uh, I think we're going to have a good time. Right, Becky and Kenton? So without further ado, Becky Wallen and Kenton Bottoms. Becky, why don't you introduce yourself first? All right. Thanks, Brent. So um, my name is Becky. Becky Wallen. I'm the Field to Fork Coordinator for the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources. Um, if you've been following along with our webinar series, I've been the host, but tonight I get to have a little bit more fun and I'm joining, uh, I'm joined by Kenton Bottoms. He's going to be, um, we're both going to be talking about turkey hunting equipment. So we'll be doing a lot of show and tell and uh, mixing it up a little bit. And um, I have been turkey hunting for not as long as Kenton has. He's going to tell you a little bit about his background, but I can tell you it's something that I thoroughly enjoy being out in the woods in the spring. There's really nothing like it. Um, when it starts getting pretty out, we're really revving to get outside anyway, and there's no better way to spend your mornings and your afternoons and your, and your weekends than in the turkey woods. Um, let me tell you, it is just a blast. It's so uh, it's a lot of action, um, which is a little bit different from deer hunting. I grew up deer hunting. I didn't get into turkey hunting until I was in college um, and my undergrad. But once I started, man, I just look forward to it every year. Um, and so that's that's a little bit about my background. I'm going to let Kenton introduce himself. Hello. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Kenton Bottoms. Um, I'm a volunteer. I helped out Becky before um, and so I guess I'll talk a little bit about my background. Um, I didn't grow up in a traditional like hunting family and uh, so for me to get into hunting it was just like on my my own will like I just I always wanted to go and stuff so I pursued it and read a lot of books we didn't I don't think they had things like this back then so I didn't get to you know, watch webinars and things. So I had to read a lot of books and I learned through a lot of trial and error, but uh, I've been turkey hunting for probably 15 or 16 years. Um, and which I'm not gonna lie to you, it took me a while before I was able to be successful and finally take a turkey. But once I did, I figured it out. Like I said, I had to learn a lot of trial and error and uh, got it figured out. And so now I'm a fairly successful turkey hunter. I'm not gonna sit here and say that I'm like, you know, some kind of superstar or anything like that. But I mean, I'm, I'm fairly successful and fairly confident in turkey hunting. So uh, that's a little bit about me. 
So I guess we will go ahead and dive into. Sorry, sorry Kenton, I couldn't get myself off mute quick enough there. Okay, sorry I didn't know. I didn't know. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Oh, you're fine. You're fine. Uh, so, yeah, good job. Uh, thank you both for, for introducing yourselves. And, yes, Kenton, you are going to have the first section today. So I've, I've left you spotlighted here. Folks, as we go, if you have questions for Kenton or Becky, questions in general, uh, drop them in the chat. We will have time for a uh, question and answer at the end of the presentation today. So drop them in the chat. I'll keep track of them. I've got a little notepad over here ready to go um, to write down your questions. So drop them in the chat if you've got questions. But yeah, Kenton, take it away. Okay. So one of the first things we're going to talk about with turkey hunting equipment is going to be firearms. So as you may or may not know, um, you can use a shotgun, which you're not allowed to use a rifle, but you can use a shotgun to legally harvest turkeys or a or archer equipment, a bow, longbow, recurve, compound, um, crossbow, any of those things. But uh, so first off, I'm going to talk about uh, shotguns and, you know, kind of what you need and what will help you be more successful and like just some some little things that I've learned and you know, that, that hopefully will help you out. So the first thing is, uh, is your, the shotgun gauge, which is basically the, uh, it's the size of the shell or the projectile, like the diameter of the projectile that you will shoot out of your shotgun. Um, so in turkey hunting nowadays, you more commonly hear of probably two or three different gauges. So you'll hear of a 12 gauge, which I'm sure a lot of people have heard of are very familiar with. I mean, that's kind of like your standard. When you think shotgun, you think of a 12 gauge. It's, uh, you know, one of those things that probably everybody's heard of. And then, you know, you'll also hear 20 gauge a lot, which is a slightly smaller diameter. And they're also having to be different color, but a slightly smaller diameter. Um, so you'll hear that one a lot. And then here recently, there's been a surge in people turkey hunting with the 410 bore, which is technically not a gauge. I mean, I guess if you were to simplify it to a gauge, it would be like a, a 67 or 68 gauge. But it, they call it a 410 bore because that's the diameter bore. But anyway, so those are going to be your common um, shotgun gauges or sizes of shotguns that you'll hear people commonly uh, take out and turkey hunt with. Um, which I'd say probably the 12 gauge is the most popular. I mean, it's probably one of the most popular, you know, shotguns that anybody has. So, um, but, uh, so those are, those are what you'll probably hear the most. And like I said, so the, the 12 gauge is the biggest, the 410 is the smallest and the 20 gauge is right there in the middle. Um, so one thing when you're turkey hunting that you always want to make sure is you always want to make sure that you have your shotgun plug. If you don't have like a break action or a single action, um, if you have like a pump action shotgun or you have a, uh, a uh, semi-automatic shotgun, you always want to make sure you have your plug in. And your plug is just a, it's a little, usually it's a plastic piece and it goes down in your magazine tube. And what it does is it restricts your gun from holding more than two shells in the, um, in the magazine. So, cause legally you're allowed to have three shells in the gun, which is normally two in the magazine and one in the chamber. So that's what you're allowed to legally hunt with. Um, so you, it's very important to make sure you have your plug because it, I mean, you can get in a lot of trouble for not having that stuff. So, you know, it's a super simple thing, easy to check. You can take and, um, you know, take some shells and load them in there to make sure you can't fit more than the max that you're allowed. And if you, for some reason, get a shotgun, like say if you buy one secondhand or somebody gives you one and it doesn't have a plug, I mean, plugs are pretty easy to find. Um, local stores like, you know, are, Cabela's probably sells them, Sportsman's Warehouse, places like that online. A lot of times you can contact the manufacturer of whatever the fire, or whoever made the firearm, and they could probably provide you with a plug. But a plug is very important. It's something you definitely want to have. Um, so from that, then I guess we will talk about um, different shot sizes. So your shot size is, it, it lets you know how big the projectiles that you're actually shooting out of your shotgun are going to be. So with turkey hunting, you want to have a decent shot size. Like you want to have a, a pretty big shot size. 
So in Kentucky, like you, you, there's like a happy medium. Like you, you want to have a shot size that's big enough to effectively take a turkey, but you also don't want to have one that's too big because then you get into danger issues with, you know, other people in the woods and things like that. So for Kentucky, um, the maximum shot size, like the biggest shot size you can use is four shot. But you can use from four shot on up. And so the way shot size works is like fours are a bigger shot size than fives. And then like, you know, so it's kind of backwards from the way that you would think about it. But um, so keep in mind that, you know, four shots, the biggest size you can, biggest shot size you can shoot legally at a turkey in Kentucky. And um, from my experience, most people will probably settle on something like a five shot. Five shot usually patterns out of a shotgun a little bit better, which I'll talk about what patterning is actually right now, I guess. So just to, just to make sure I'm clear on this, Kenton. Yeah. So the, this, the larger, the number of yeah. shot, the smaller, the smaller the shot actually is. Yeah. Okay. The larger the number of the, like if it's 10 shot is smaller than one shot. One shot's really big. 10 shots really small. So um, thank you, Kenton. Thank you for clarifying. Uh, and let's see. So you know, like I said, four shots, the biggest size that you can shoot. Um, most people will, like I said, uh, most people I know if they're shooting, well, now that's another thing too. So most people will probably shoot lead shot, which that means the projectiles that they're shooting are going to be made out of lead. Um, but now there's a new thing that came out. I don't know, it's been out a little while, but it's fairly new still. And it's called tungsten super shot or TSS for short. I'm sure you you know, you'll hear of it or, you know, you may have already heard of it. But um, what the tungsten super shot is, is it's actually a non-toxic projectile, but it is denser, so it's heavier than lead. So what that means is you can drop your shot size or go up in shot size, but still have the same density as a lower shot size lead shot. So I think it's like a nine shot TSS is the same density as a five shot lead or four or five shot lead. So you really gain an advantage there um, with, uh, you know, pellet, pellet count or like the number of projectiles and things like that. But um, so earlier I mentioned pattern, like the way your shotgun patterns. And so basically what a pattern is, is it's like, it's what the way the arrangement that the projectiles come out of your shotgun and how they relate, you know, how they hit on the target. So that's going to be your pattern. And so for turkey hunting, you're going to want a tighter pattern because, you know, it's not like if you were to be hunting something like doves or ducks or something like that, where you have to shoot something that's fine. Usually turkeys, when you're, when you're shooting at a turkey, they're, you know, they're walking in, they're, you know, on the ground, they're fairly still. I mean, they never really stop moving, but they're, you know, they're fairly still. So you want to really be precise. So you want to, what you want to do is you'll, you'll um, want to find an appropriate, which I can get it out of here, but uh, an appropriate choke to get the right pattern so that you can be effective. And so what a choke does is it, um, the way I like to think of it is, it's like if you had a water hose and you and you just let it go and you're just letting that water hose dump the water out, it doesn't shoot very far. It's not, you know, it's just kind of going wherever it wants to go. But when you choke it down and put your thumb over it, then you can get really precise and you can shoot a smaller stream and, you know, you can aim that exactly where you want. So that's kind of the way a shotgun choke works is um, it constricts the shot as it comes out of the barrel and keeps it to where it's in a tighter pattern. So you end up with, uh, you know, more of your pellets in the area that you aim at, which is, you know, on a turkey, you, you're gonna wanna aim, you know, somewhere in the, in the neck area, neck to head area. So, I mean, it, it concentrates your pellets so that you can be more effective. And also that, I mean, that has a lot to do with your range as to how far away you can effectively harvest a turkey. 
um, the more open your pattern is, the uh, the less yardage you're going to want between you and the turkey when you go to shoot at it. Because you know you you want as many pellets to hit the turkey in a vital area as you can. So, um, and I've got a couple of different patterns here. Like so, this one is from a 410 shotgun which is very, very small. It shoots these little things, which are tiny. But um, th it was loaded with a uh, number nine TSS, which is that tungsten super shot. So even though it's got those really small pellets, they are very dense. And so like this, this would have killed the turkey. I mean, it's, you know, it would have been a decent shot. Now this is from 40 yards. So it's like, I do have a fairly tight choking because normally, it'll spread way more than that at, at that distance. But um, so uh, let's see. One second. Okay, so here is, you know, I've got a pattern. Now this is from a 20 gauge and you can see how many pellets and hits there are on this one. And this is from uh, 30 yards with a 20 gauge with uh, number seven and number nine TSS. So you can tell once again, a fairly tight choke so that your, my pattern, the bulk of my pattern is on the actual turkey, which is gonna lead it to me having a better success at harvesting the turkey cleanly and mainly um, because I have a lot of, my, my patterns choked down. So I got a lot of hits right where I need them. Um, so that's a very important thing to think about. And so what you want to do is, and this is the, this is the hard part, because um, sometimes it takes a little trial and error, but sometimes you'll go through several choke tubes, which are what constricts your shot down, to find one that works with your gun and the ammo that you're wanting to shoot. Because, I mean, you know, nowadays it's like, it's not so much what you want to shoot, it's what you can get a hold of. And, I mean, there's a lot of different shots that, that you can harvest a turkey with, but... Um, you just really want to make sure you take the time to, and you don't have to have a fancy turkey target like that. You can take a, a sheet of poster board and put a dot on it, aim at that dot, and then kind of take what, what standard is a 10 inch circle or like a, a pie plate. And you can take that and kind of, that'll kind of give you an idea of like where you're hitting, where your uh, pattern is hitting and like, you know, how, what, what kind of pattern density you have. Because like, you know, like I said, you know, you want as many, as many pellets in uh, the area where you're aiming as possible. And so with that being said, I mean, a lot of people think, you know, well, I'm shooting a gun. So, I mean, I could probably shoot a turkey from forever away or something like that. Well, that's not necessarily true due to the way that shotguns work and the patterns and how they spread out as, um, you know, as the distance gets further from the barrel where they're fired. Um, so. I would say, you know, the average shot on a turkey is somewhere between 15 and 30 yards, somewhere in there. And I, you know, personally, I probably don't see a need for trying to shoot at a turkey any further than 30 yards, um, which, I mean, I'm sure it happens, and it, it, there's people that do. But uh, for me, that's just where I feel comfortable, and I know I got a lot of hits um, in the area that I need them. I know, I know what my pattern's doing, but I wouldn't know that if I didn't pattern my shotgun. So, um but uh, and another thing, which is uh, away from patterning, but just turkey hunting equipment in general, is a sling. So a sling that goes on your shotgun. These things, my goodness, so valuable because you know you don't always want to just have your shotgun in your hands, or you know sometimes turkey hunting you have to walk a whole lot, and so it's very nice to be able to have that. You can sling it over your shoulder. It's still safe. It keeps the muzzle in a safe direction. It's, you know, it's a, it's a safe way to carry the gun and your hands free. So maybe you're wanting to call, you're running a POC style call or something like that. And you can do that and still have your gun right there, easy access, but uh, you're not having to lug it around or fiddle, you know, fiddle around with uh, carrying it around and stuff. Um, but those, that's something that I like to use a lot. I utilize a sling all the time. Um, it's, you know, it's one of those things that stays on my shotgun because I just, I like slings. They're, they're handy to me. Um, and uh, let's see. So my shotgun that I have here, this is my 20 gauge. This is my primary gun that I turkey hunt with. 
And you'll notice it has a weird thing on the top, which is a rail, and it has an, uh, a, a red dot sight on top is what I have on my turkey gun. And so that red dot sight allows me to be able to adjust my aiming point to wherever the densest part of my pattern is. So instead of having, uh, you know, having to use like Kentucky windage, which is basically knowing like, well, my gun shoots three inches to the left and two inches down and trying to figure out where to hold on the turkey. This lets it be where I can adjust that red dot to be exactly where the pattern is. So I know if I put the dot on the turkey, the bulk of my pattern is going to hit right there. And so, you know, red dots are pretty pricey, pretty expensive. Not every, it's not easy to mount one on every gun. So, I mean, there's other ways you can get around that. Um, there are a lot of companies that sell like a rifle style sight. So it'll be like a two dots in the back and one in the one in the front that'll be adjustable. And then that way you can still um, get some adjustment and kind of make your pattern, which, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and say that every gun's going to not shoot exactly where you're aiming down the bead, but um, sometimes you will have issues with, with stuff like that. So. It, you know, there's a couple ways to get around it. One is like having a, a, a red dot sight or a, a set aftermarket set of adjustable sights, which they make them to fit just about any shotgun. I mean, I think you can, you know, mount them on just about anything. Um, but uh, that's just, that's something helpful. Um, most of the time that's not needed. And, you know, honestly, every turkey I've ever killed, this is the first year I've ever had a red dot. So um, I just wanted to try it. I wanted to try something new. But every turkey I've ever killed, I killed just aiming down the bead, shooting it the way that it came from the factory. It's, you know, you don't need to spend more money. And another thing, you don't have to have a camouflage gun either. Um, you know, there's, you, you're just fine with a, like a, a black gun, like one that's like Parkerized black or like a, a even blue or something like that. Uh, now this one's a little shiny and I don't really love that, but I mean, it'll still work. You can still kill turkeys with this. Um, you, you're just gonna have to be a little more steel so they don't pick you out. But I mean, you don't have to, you don't have to spend the extra money to get something camouflaged. That's not necessary. It's not necessary. You just don't have to do it. But I mean, it is nice. It's a nice touch. I mean, if you, if you have the extra funds or, you know, you wanna do that. Um, also, another thing you could do which is what I did to this one, is I actually painted this gun myself. Um, it was black, and then I just painted it camo with some spray paint. It's not it's not going to last forever. It's not going to be the prettiest paint job, but it, it is flat. It uh, doesn't shine in the light or anything like that. And so, I you know, it was just something I was like, well, you know, I, I want to try it. The gun wasn't too expensive, so I gave it a shot. Um, but I mean, you know, those are those are pretty much the basics uh, of like a turkey shotgun, you know, and 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 things you need to do to get prepared with your shotgun. So remember, you know, you can't shoot anything larger than four shots. Um, you're another thing. So in a 12 gauge they, and 20 gauge, they make a two and three quarter inch shell, which is smaller. It's a it's a shorter shell. And then they make a, uh, a three inch in 20 and 12 gauge, and a, which these are both three inch shells. That's a 20 gauge and a 12 gauge three inch shells. So these are more of what they, they would most of the time call them magnum shells. And so what they're, they're gonna usually have a little more payload, maybe a little more velocity. And so that is, that's just gonna add to your pellets on target which is the ultimate goal is to have as many pellets in the area that you're aiming so that you can effectively harvest the turkey. Um, and then in the 12 gauge, they also have a three and a half inch, which you can see the size difference between a three inch and a three and a half inch 12 gauge. It's quite a bit bigger. Um, and what that's gonna do is, like I said, maximize your uh, pellet count. So the three and a half inch shell is gonna be able to hold more pellets than the three inch is going to be able to hold more pellets than the two and three quarter inch shell. Um, but uh, so usually you're better off going with a magnum shell. So you're going to want to use a three inch or a three and a half. But you got to be careful because not every 12 gauge shotgun is capable of handling um, three and a half inch shells. And there are some older guns that can't handle um, three inch shells. 
So it's always very important that you take your gun and on just about every gun, which you're not gonna be able to see it on this one, which is, I'm sorry, but on the barrel, they'll, they'll have a barrel stamp, usually on the right side toward the rear of the barrel. And it'll usually tell you what size shells that you can shoot out of that gun because you don't want to you don't want to shoot the wrong size shells for the gun because um, you know you can they can end up making the gun uh, dangerous and not not safe to shoot. I mean you you can end up getting injured. So that's a very important thing before you buy any ammo for the shotgun you have. Make sure you check your shotgun and see what type of shells you are able to shoot out of that shotgun. And uh, another thing with chokes, not all shotguns have interchangeable chokes either. So like these, you know, a lot of your modern guns will have a screw in chokes where you can unscrew them and screw different ones in. And uh, But a, a thing to be aware of there is um, making sure that if you do have a gun with screw chokes, you buy the correct choke for your gun. So not every 20 gauge choke fits every 20 gauge gun. They have different thread patterns. Um, just like, I mean, the, think of it like different bolts. Like they're, they, they just have different thread pitches on them and things and uh, different technologies there. So um, a good thing that I've used to figure out which uh, chokes I can use in my gun is uh, if you go to chokeTube.com, which it's Carlson's Choke Tube's webpage, and they have a, uh, a choke tube finder where you can go on there and you can look up what uh, brand and model gun you have and it'll tell you exactly what thread, thread pattern uh, choke tube you need for your gun. And uh, one more thing about choke tubes is most companies will sell a choke tube that is branded as a turkey choke tube. Now, one company may have four or five different turkey choke tubes, but what you're, so the difference in those will be the diameter. So the choke, it, it'll be how tight the choke is or how much constriction it is putting on the, the shot from the normal diameter of the barrel. And that stuff gets a little more technical, but I mean, for, for just starting out, I would just get, get a turkey choke tube or, or even just a full choke tube and just uh, you know find you some, some Magnum shotgun shells, size four or up, which I wouldn't personally, if you're not shooting TSS, I don't want to, I don't like to shoot over a six shot. So from four shot to six shot is where I'll shoot, is what I'll shoot in lead, which that's what I, I shoot five shot in lead. Every lead turkey load that I have is going to be a five shot. But then if you, if you are uh, find the TSS shot, then you can go down in shot size so you can, or up in shot size so you can shoot a smaller shot size. So in TSS, I shoot uh, anywhere from seven shot to nine shot. But I wouldn't shoot seven shot or nine shot um, lead at turkeys just because I don't, you're not gonna have the, the density to, to deliver to the turkey when you, know, when you hit it with the shot to be able to ethically kill it at uh, distances past probably 20, 30 yards or probably not even 30 yards, probably 20 yards. So I like to stick with, you know, if you're shooting lead, I would go from anywhere from four shot to six shot and then if you can find some tungsten super shot or TSS shells, um, you can go from anywhere from seven to nine shot is what is what uh, is the most widely available. So, I mean, those, those are just, you know, some of the things to consider when you're talking about firearms for hunting turkeys. Awesome, thanks, Kenton. Um, I am going to take over for a second and talk about archery equipment. And um, I just want to lead with that archery hunting for turkeys is a little bit more of an advanced level style of hunting for turkeys, but it is legal. So we wanted to talk about the equipment just a little bit. Um, you got a couple different options for the archery equipment. You can use the long bows, a recurve bow, a compound bow or a crossbow. And I have examples of each one, um, except the longbow. Um, but let me grab these real quick. So the first one I'll show you is the recurve. And it, the reason it's called a recurve is you can tell real, right away, the limbs are curved 
on both ends. Now, if this was strung, the string would run right down the back here and you'd hold it like so. Let me back up just a little bit more. You can see a little bit better. So that's our recurve. These are legal to use for hunting turkeys in Kentucky. You've also got the compound bow. Now, right away, you can see that the limbs are a little bit shorter, and that's because you have the mechanical advantage of the cam system, um, and the limbs are um, more stiff as well. This one is not dressed up. It doesn't have a side or anything. Um, you might, you know, your, your archery equipment, you would tailor to you and, the, and your style, uh, but this is just a bare bow, bare compound bow, and you could use it um, for turkey hunting. Now with the bows and the crossbows, there's no uh, minimum draw weight, um, but with the crossbows, here we've got a crossbow you could use. They do have to have, to be legal, a working um, safety device. So on this one, let me get close up here so that you can see. Here's our safety device. You'll notice that um, it shows you, you know, if when it's on, it's in the backwards position. It is not technically on at this point because for this bow, um, you have to have it in the forward position to load, to cock the arrow, um, to cock the string so that you can load the arrow and it automatically puts it in the safety. So um, each one is different. Not all of them are that away, but this is just a crossbow example, something you could use out in the turkey woods. Now, let me grab my chair. When you're using archery equipment, you're going to be using the tip on your arrow called a broadhead. So this is a broadhead. There's multiple different kinds of broadheads. This one is a fixed blade. So each one of these ridges is um, a razor blade, basically. And this one is, is fixed. So these don't move. They don't change position. You can't remove them. You have to take the whole broadhead off. Um, there are a couple other ones. There's removables so that each blade you can replace. Um, and then there are mechanicals that are usually rubber banded towards the back here. And upon impact of the animal, the blades expand and it creates a wider cutting surface. Um, to be legal in Kentucky, your broadheads must cut seven eighths of an inch. Um, and don't worry about getting out a tape measure. When you buy your broadheads, it's going to tell you on the package um, what the cutting diameter is. So seven eighths of an inch for both uh, broadheads that fit your, your lateral bows, your long bows, your recurves and your compounds and the crossbows, all the same, okay? Now, something to note, there are lots of, very, of um, options for your broadheads. And if you are a deer hunter or you're a target shooter for archery and you switch to uh, switch the, the broadhead or the tip on your arrow to turkey hunt, then you have to repractice. You have to shoot your bow again, make sure that you're still hitting your target. Um, because anything that you change will change how your arrow flies. So make sure you get um, a target that you can shoot a broadhead into and practice if you make any adjustments at all. Um, the farthest range for archery equipment is totally dependent on what you're comfortable with, which is what kind of Kenton was talking about um, a little bit earlier with the shotguns, but we do recommend for beginners a maximum range of 30 yards, and that's pretty far out there for archery equipment, even crossbows. It's a common misconce misconception that a crossbow is an advantage over um, other bows. Um, as far as the distance that you can shoot. And um, so, but we say the same for both. 30 yards maximum uh, for your archery equipment, especially for us, uh, for, your, for the beginners out there. Shot placement with archery equipment. You're gonna be aiming for the head and neck area just like you do for, with your firearms. That's, uh, it does require a little bit of practice and skill Kitten already mentioned that turkeys don't sit around um, or sit still 
much at all. Um, so it takes patience and, and skill, and that's why it's considered a more um, advanced level of turkey hunting. So that was very quick, but if you have questions, if you are really, really wanting to dive into archery hunting for turkeys, you can reach out to me um, after the webinar or, and, and uh, Brent can throw my email down in there. You probably already have it from registration, but it's becky.wallen at ky.gov. So we can talk more about archery hunting for turkeys, but that's about it. And if you have questions for tonight, throw them in the chat. And so now we're gonna go back to Kenton. He's gonna talk about some turkey decoys for us. Yeah, so uh, turkey hunting, um, a lot of times, a lot of people use decoys to, to help attract turkeys, to, to make them feel more comfortable so they stick around longer so that you can get that shot off. Um, and, you know, sometimes, it, you know, it'll make them stay still long enough to where, you know, you have plenty of time to get a shot off and things like that. So, um, you know, one of the things I want to talk about is like how many turkey decoys do you need? What kind of turkey decoys do you need? Um, do you even need turkey decoys? Well, all those things kind of depend on where you're hunting. So if, if, for instance, say you like to, you hunt a field edge or like where you're going to hunt as has like a big field edge. So it's like the, you know, like a tree row and then like a big open field or an ag field or something like that, an agriculture field. Um, you're, you're probably definitely gonna wanna use decoys. Um, they, they have a lot of drawing power and I mean, turkeys are very curious. So, you know, they'll, they'll come check things out and they like to keep tabs on each other. They're pretty social animals, which I think you all already went over like uh, turkey biology and things like that in a previous um, uh, webinar. But um, so that's correct. But go ahead and expand all you need to, Kenton. Oh, okay. All right. Um. So you know, in the springtime, spring turkey hunting, um, is during the turkeys' mating season. So obviously, the turkeys are walking around looking for mates. They're trying to find you know other turkeys to mate with, and so during this during that time period, the male turkeys get aggressive. And they want to push other male turkeys away so they can have all the females to themselves. It's a uh, kind of like deer do when they get in the rut. You know, they'll fight a lot and stuff like that. Well, male turkeys do the same thing. And so one of the, you know, one of the easiest things to do, and one of, you know, one of your more basic things is like just a hen decoy. And so this is just a, this is a cheap foam decoy, and it is, uh, it's just made to look like a hen turkey. Another thing that I forgot to mention earlier is shooting sticks. Now shooting sticks are, they can really save your butt when you're turkey hunting because, you know, when a turkey comes in and he's gobbling his head off and everything, it's like, you're just not human if that doesn't get your heart pumping and you, you know, shaking around a little bit. So uh, uh, some shooting sticks, which I mean, these ones do have red grips on them, but they make them with camouflage grips. Um, you could take tape and cover these up, like camouflage duct tape or something. But something like this, these are really good. They just help you get a steady shot. And, uh, you know, to go back to one more thing, when you're patterning your shotgun, I like to put myself in a position like I'm going to be turkey hunting. If I know the majority of my turkey hunting is going to be done, you know, walking around, setting up against a tree, I'll take my turkey vest, set up against a tree, set my target out, and kind of, you know, shoot my gun the way that I would hunt. And that just kind of helps you practice um, the way that you're going to play, if you will. Um, but, uh, you know, that's that's a few of those things, you know. Um, and another thing to talk about is um, with the turkey vest or with a backpack or anything, I suggest carrying something to carry your stuff in because, you know, it's going to be hot. You're going to want to have maybe some bug spray. You're going to want to have a water bottle. Something that I always have is some water because you just, you know, water, you got to have it. Um, and all kind of other little things like that. But um, when you're turkey hunting, just because the weather in the spring, especially in Kentucky, you never know what you're going to get. It might be almost ready to snow one day and the next day it'd be 90 degrees. You just never know. Um, so one thing about a turkey vest or a backpack or anything like that, it allows you to carry multiple different types of calls. So I know that in my vest, I always have uh, mouth calls, like diaphragm calls, um, I always have like diaphragm calls in my vest and I'll keep uh, 
friction calls or like a, a, a pot call in my vest. Um, and those are just kind of two different things. Cause like when it's raining, you know, your friction call won't work as well because you know, the rain is going to defeat the purpose of the friction. Um, so, you know, you, I'll have my mouth calls, but if, you know, and sometimes I want to sound like more than one Turkey and I'll run a mouth call and a, 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 a pot style call at the same time or a box call. Um, but, you know, it's just important to be ready for just about any kind of uh, weather scenario because you just don't know what you're going to get. And like Becky said, you know, a rain jacket, which also in your turkey vest or your backpack, in the back pouch, you can put your uh, your rain jacket or rain gear, whatever, poncho, whatever it is. Um, it's just nice. Uh, a turkey vest is just a really organized way to, um, <laughs> it's a really organized way to, to just, just keep all your stuff on you and it just makes it to where, you know, I don't even have to think about it. I know exactly where my stuff is on my vest because I've been using the same turkey vest for a couple of years now. But I mean, the same can be said for a backpack. Um, you know, once you get used to it, you'll know you can flip it off. You'll know exactly what pocket to go to to get your stuff. But being organized can really help you out, especially, you know, like say you strike up a Tom and he's coming in quick and you got to get stuff set up and you don't have time to sit there and dig through and look at things. If you're really organized and like use a vest or a backpack or something like that, you know exactly where to go to get anything you need. And, um, you know, it, 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 it just helps you save time and be, be ready for the moment when it comes. So uh, that's a few little tips and tricks. And like I said, um, with a turkey vest, if I was just starting off and when I was just starting off, I didn't have a turkey vest. I kind of let myself go a couple years and figure out exactly the things that I wanted to need. I, that I was going to need while I was hunting to help me pick out a vest that worked well for what I do. Cause they make all different kinds of Turkey vests. Um, they have different pockets. They make lighter ones that, that have bare minimum pockets for somebody who maybe is running up and down mountains all day and stuff like that, which I don't do that. Um, but uh, you know, so maybe, maybe a backpack is, is definitely a cheaper way to start. So you don't have to invest too much money, but you can still be very effective with. So um from here, I'm going to throw it back to Be Becky, and uh, she's going to talk about uh, tick repellent, I think. Yeah. Uh, so the last, we're getting close to the end here. I know that we've gone over a little bit on our hour. So um, if you do have to go, that's okay. We've got the recording. It'll be up. Um, it may not be automatically. I think we were having a little bit of technical trouble, but we will get the recording up as soon as we can for you and we appreciate you joining us, but we're gonna keep going and we're not gonna skip the question and answer section. So if you've got a question, you can stick around for that too. Um, tick repellent, bug repellent is so important. You don't want this to be an afterthought, um, it, especially with all of the tick-borne um, illnesses that you can contract from them. Um, they're just nasty boogers and you want to do what you can to keep them off of you. So I showed the DEET spray here um, to, you know, you, you, if you're not allergic, you can use it on your skin and your clothes. Um, Kenton has his thermocell. Thank you. Um, and so basically the thermocell, it, you put it in the blind with you, like near you um, under your chair or something, or you hang it off of your chair or whatever. And um, it uses a cartridge fuel and a mat that is saturated with repellent and you stick it in there um, and turn it on and it runs and creates like this barrier, this like ozone type barrier for you. Um, thanks, Kenton. And then another option is permethrin to spray on your clothes only, not your skin. Um, you treat your clothes before you go to the field and you let it dry completely. And it actually lasts on your clothes for um, a couple of washes as well. So we use that on everything, socks, um, mask, gloves, everything. Cause I do not want ticks at all. Um, not saying that you can use all three of these and still get a tick, but it's worth, um, it's worth doing what you can to keep them off of you. And the last thing, but not the least important by, by any means, a uh, piece of equipment is probably the most important piece of equipment that you need is your license and 
your hunter education certification card, your orange card. So I keep mine in my backpack all the time. I don't have a turkey vest. Um, this is my hunting backpack. It goes deer hunting, it goes turkey hunting. And so um, I will put my most up-to-date license in my backpack and keep it there. And also the harvest log. Um, you can, this is last year's harvest log. So um, you need this for turkey hunting. You need it for deer hunting because you need to keep a record of um, the animals that you have to tell a check, which include turkey and deer in Kentucky. Um, so there's spaces on this and it's just very convenient because it prints right beside your license and you can just cut it out all together and keep it together. Uh, you have to hang on to your harvest log all season, which is why mine's still in here. And then don't forget, unless you're going to prick your finger, you need a pen. <laughs> you need a pen or a pencil, which won't bleed in the rain. Um, in your pack so that you can record your harvests in the field because you are um, the you know the law states that you record that um, at least most of the information on the harvest log like the species the date the sex and the county before you move the animal before you do anything with it so don't forget those two very important pieces of equipment um, and my orange card is in my wallet all the time. Um, if you don't have, I'll take a moment to plug this. If you don't have your hunter certification at this time, um, you can still get it. And even though we're not doing in-person classes, we're offering a virtual option. Um, we've had the virtual classes option in the past. You can still do that. Um, and you can find all of this on our website and then for now, while we're still doing social distancing, you can do a virtual range day that you record yourself with a mentor and submit that to um, for the next step in, in your Hunter Ed certification. Once you've completed a successful video that's been reviewed and approved, then you get certified and it, you can find your card on your my profile. So check out our website for all the information on that. But don't fret because you it's you can still get it. Um, and I think unless I've forgotten anything, Kenton, um, I think that's it. And we can take questions at this point. <clears throat> okay, let's see here. I'm gonna unspotlight you. <clears throat> I think you should be unspotlighted now. I'm going to try something here. I'm going to hide non-video participants. So people should be just seeing the three of us if they've got us on gallery view, I believe. <laughs> we'll see if it works. Uh, thank you, uh, Kenton and Becky both. Thank you all for uh, all the good information. I do have some questions. Um, I am going to go ahead and follow up real quick on what Becky was saying. Yes, go to the go to the website. It is not too late to get your hunter education certification. It takes, if you're good, you can get the classroom portion done in about five hours online. And there is a free option on that as well. And then, yeah, there's a video range uh, to where you complete it. Um, you send it to your appropriate county contact, which we have a list on our website as well. So uh, if you're if you're thinking about doing it, get out there, get it done. It's, it's all free. You can do it all from home. Um, no excuses, right? It's my story and I'm sticking to it. All right, questions. Uh, this first one was more of a statement than a question. Um, uh, Kenton, earlier you were talking about plugs and you were talking about, about um, plastic commercially prepared plugs that you buy at Cabela's or wherever. Uh, there's no reason you couldn't use, say, a dowel rod or something like that, correct? No, no. you could absolutely use a dowel rod. Um, I would just, uh, you know, the reason why I like to tell people to just go ahead and use a, uh, a commercially available plug is 
sometimes if you know if you're not so familiar with your your firearm or or firearms in general um sticking something foreign down in there could cause a malfunction or something like that and so you know i i just find it a little safer but in a pinch yes you can absolutely use like a dowel rod and actually some guns the uh, plug they come with um is like a dowel rod with a little o-ring on it so i mean yeah it, it can be as easy as that yeah absolutely if you're uh desperate i mean desperate yes yeah, I mean, like it's it's definitely safer and uh and and just i think better to just go ahead and get uh what it get the get get what it was supposed to come with because in that way, you know, if anything ever happens, you can tell your conservation officer, hey, you know, this is um, th this is what the plug that the gun came with, you know, and, you know, I just think you have more of a leg to stand on that way if anything ever happens or if anybody ever questions it rather than using a dowel rod or something. If, if you're if you're really, really desperate because you've done all this preparation, you're out in the field and you realize you're out in the field and you're in violation because you're not plugged. And you just just all of a sudden realize that. I mean, a stick can work, but you need to be desperate because then you're going to risk damaging your firearm in the process. Uh, so you might want to know what you're doing before you just shove a stick down in your 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 tube magazine tube on your uh, your firearm, not down the barrel, uh, mind you. But yeah, it it can be plugged with a lot of things. Yeah, spent shotgun shells even will work, uh, not live shotgun shells. Yeah, and if you're using a stick, make sure it's not green so it doesn't rust your gun from the inside out. Very good. Very true. Yep. Okay, next one. Uh, Becky, this was for you, I believe. Is digital, digital military style camouflage okay? Um, I don't see why it couldn't work. Uh, it, obviously, it's a not as... Um, natural looking as the leaves um, that are that you kind of see the leaves and stick kind of pattern on some of the other things out there. Um, as long as it wasn't too light for your surrounding, and then I think you could still work, especially if you're going to have a stake blind up or something of that nature. Be careful of your movements. Um, I say use what you got if that's what you've got. Give it a try, and if if you can see that turkey just eyeballing you from across the way, maybe try something else next time. But yeah, um, I say give it a try. Okay, we got a comment earlier. And I think the, the kicker with that is that, and, and again, I, I'm not a turkey hunter yet. I will be, but I'm not yet. And the, the kicker with that is that turkey can see in better definition than say deer can. So a deer with military camo no big deal. Am, am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, I would say no big deal. And with turkeys, from my experience, and this is just my experience, um, I care more about being still than what camouflage I'm wearing. Because I mean, I've, I've killed turkeys wearing uh, tree stand camo, which is like, it's pretty light colored and stuff like that. And it's like, you know, if you be still, then and don't draw attention to yourself, then you know you can get away with just about any camouflage I would imagine, but definitely wearing something that that's got the greens in it and is a little more lifelike is going to be better and probably let you get away with a little more movement. But you can, you know, you, you can definitely get away with like that that military digital camo. I, I'd imagine. I'm with Becky. I'm a big fan of whatever's cheap. Yes, that is definitely. And, you know, Walmart, I, that's where I buy a lot of my camo. Walmart after the season when it goes on sale, hey, and it works just as good as anything. It's got camo on it, and, uh, you know, it, it'll work. Very good. Uh, can either of you all talk about using range finders with oh, yeah. turkey hunting? So that's one thing I forgot to mention about in my turkey vest. So when I'm hunting, I definitely – I always have binoculars and a rangefinder with me. Um, and I use those things, the binoculars, because like say um, I, I didn't hear any turkeys gobbling, but I've used my maps and stuff and I know that there's a field over here. Well, before I get to the edge of the field, I'll use my binoculars 
scan around and try to, you know, see if there's any turkeys out there and try and map my approach out. And then uh, like, say you're, you're setting up your decoys, you want to make sure that you have your decoy set at an appropriate distance away from you. You can use your range finder to set your decoys up. And then that way, you know, and like one thing I like to do, especially if I'm like walking around and I just strike a, a turkey up and he's coming in and I'm trying to get everything set up. One of the last things I'll do is I'll pull my range finder out and I'll range around at different, like say there's a stick that I can see very clearly and it sticks out. I'll range that and say, okay, well that's 30 yards. So if he gets to that stick, he's in at 30 yards. If he gets to the decoys, he's at 20 yards. If he gets to this tree, you know, you can kind of range around you and, and figure out, you know, what what can be your boundary for your max shooting distance with a shotgun is less important like you know you, you're not going to really do much difference if the turkey's at uh 10 yards versus 30 yards or whatever you're not going to do too much different but with a bow it's very important and uh, you know using a rangefinder is huge and you know if you've never really been close to turkeys it's very easy to see a turkey and it may be 50 60 yards away and you're like oh man that turkey's so close you know, and you might think that it's at 30, 20, 30 yards away, but it's really 50, 60 yards away. So, you know, a rangefinder is definitely good to, to help you, you know, understand like that distance and, you know, how things look out in nature from distances. Very good. Very good. Okay. Next one. Um, <clears throat> This one's a near and dear to my heart, actually. I'm glad somebody posted this question, and I'm curious myself. Becky's heard me harp time and time again about the importance of using non-toxic shot. <laughs> <She's>, yeah. <laughs> and because I've, uh, you know, well, anyway. Um, it, but I, I do know, and this person mentioned it earlier in the chat, that, that TSS uh, can be pretty darn expensive. I, I actually had to Google it just to look to confirm that his, his price estimate was correct. And yeah. If I'm reading this right, ten dollars a a shell uh, potentially at times. Um, so, what's the limitations there with with uh, with price with TSS shot and that sort of thing, Kenton? Any of that sounding familiar to you? Yeah. So now the way the way that I look at it is yes, like so this box of Browning TSS, um, I think it ended up costing me like thirty seven dollars for five shot shells. And you're probably thinking, wow, that is ridiculous. That's ridiculously expensive. And it is, it's very expensive, especially if you're coming from a background or you're used to shooting like targets, or like clays or something like that. You know, five or $6 gets you a whole box of 25 shot shells. So you're like, well, why in the world do I have to use this or that? Well, so TSS, I mean, the way I look at it is the animal's worth it. And I'm gonna put all this work in. And in Kentucky, we're only allowed to harvest two toms or two bearded turkeys in the spring season so that's potentially two shots i want to have everything in my favor if i'm able to get up on a turkey and get that shot because i number one i owe it to the animal to be as effective as i can and i mean i'm telling you tss is the patterns you get with it are so much more dense than lead and so you know you you are more effective with it and so like for me it's like you know capitalizing on every chance i get i mean turkeys you know they're not they're not the easiest animals to kill um you know very hard to get up on i mean turkeys are very wily and they're you know they have very good instincts um so it's like i just want to maximize every chance i get and you know you know you can i've killed a, a lot of turkeys with lead you don't have to use tss you know it's not a requirement or anything like that but for me it just makes me feel good because i know it's gonna, you know, I'm gonna put more pellets in that turkey. I'm gonna effectively dispatch that turkey. It's not gonna suffer or anything. I'm not gonna have to chase it around wounded or anything because I know that that shot is so effective. So it is very expensive and you don't have to do it, especially just starting out. I started out using lead shot. That's probably what I would do if I was just starting out. Like if there's no need to jump up and just buy really expensive stuff. Now, if you get into it like I have and you really like it and you know turkey hunting something you're gonna do, continue to do then yeah you know because like so this box of shot shells potentially that's five turkeys right there that, that that could be five turkeys that uh you know that that i could that i could harvest with that box of shells and to me five turkeys is definitely worth you know one turkey's worth ten dollars to me to, to spend on that shot shell 
So, you know, it, it just kind of depends on who you are and like how you look at it. But you definitely don't have to use TSS. And they also make a, a, make like a blend. So this is a federal third degree and it's a blend of uh, lead and uh, TSS. And so that's a way that, that you kind of can get some of the benefits of TSS with a lower cost because of the lesser amount of TSS in that shell. It's a, it's a more cost effective shell, but you still get the attributes of having the TSS in there. So, you know, there, there's stuff like that as well. But uh, I didn't say this earlier, but I would probably shy away from steel shot for turkeys. And mainly because steel shot, usually most turkey chokes, you're not supposed to shoot steel shot out of. It doesn't constrict, it doesn't deal with getting constricted down in a choke tube like lead or the TSS. The TSS, they use a, a buffering compound. And, you know, there's, there's certain things they do because it is very hard as well. But they, you know, they, they have technology built into the shell to make it able to interact with a, a choke tube. Most steel shot does not. Also, steel is not very dense at all. It's very light. So you don't get that, that uh, you know, it doesn't have the same density and you're not going to get the same effect with your hits on target as you would with either lead or TSS, so. Very good, and thank you for diving a, a little bit into the science behind it too. That's, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm nerding out a little bit when uh, listening to you talk, it's fantastic. So, very good, very good. Um, okay, uh, have you compared Onyx versus HuntStand Pro Maps? I have not compared the two. I do know of Hunt Stand. I've heard a lot of good things about Hunt Stand. Uh, to be honest with you, I just I found Onyx first, and that's why I use it. Uh, I'm pretty sure they probably have almost like the, the same features and stuff, a lot of the same stuff going on. But any of those map apps, any map app that can use your phone GPS and give you like a topo map or, a, or an aerial map, um, you know, is, is, is going to be of use right there. And I mean, before I had Onyx, I would just use um, Google, they're not Google Maps because I have an iPhone, but I would use the Apple Maps app and just look at the satellite view. And you can tell a lot from that once you get to knowing what you're looking at. So, I mean, uh, definitely I've heard of HuntStand. I've heard a lot of people really rave about it. So I'm sure that's a great app as well. Um, but it's like, you know, it kind of just depends on what you, you know, what you like or whatever, you know, you end up getting first or whatever. So, you know, but I mean, they do cost a little bit of money, but from what I can tell, you know, I think Onyx is like 20 to $25 a year for the maps of the state of Kentucky. And I think it's worth every penny personally, but I mean, I, I'm pretty sure HuntStand has some of the similar technology or the, you know, same things and will tell you the different information like Onyx will as well. Well, and I do know that, uh, if you really don't want to spend any money on it, uh, like some of us don't really want to spend any money, you can use a combination of uh, Apple Maps or Google Maps and your PVA's website. And if it's the, the fall on your deer hunting, you can use a uh, uh, weather channel app for, for wind direction. And I mean, you can, you can get real creative with it. You can come up with, with a lot of the stuff that some of those, those paid apps kind of put all in one, one handy package. Uh, you can get all that for free too. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that, Brent. And I did put the link to the maps tab on the fish and on our fish and wildlife website in the chat. Um, if you guys want to scroll up and find that, it's it's just under the more tab on our new web page, and you'll find maps. Um, that's what I use. I use the PDFs and I use uh, Google Maps and Google Earth. That's how I roll. <laughs> Google Earth and Walmart camo. All right, let's see here. Uh, okay, so, okay, this one's kind of a weighted question, I think, but bare minimum, brand new turkey hunter, just starting out, what's the bare minimum, like if you were to put it in a list form, a bulleted, bulleted list form, what would you need in the field? You, you want me to do? I'll yeah, go. go for it, yeah. Okay, so for me, if I'm going bare minimum, and I'm trying to do the bare minimum turkey hunt. Number one, you're gonna need a you're gonna need a shotgun because that's gonna be your your cheapest route. I feel like so a shotgun, shot shells, all that stuff. Pattern it, know what it's doing, um, and then you, you could also get away with uh, 
you know, with a shotgun and a turkey call, you can and and some camo, hand me down camo or thrift store camo. You could you can be a successful turkey hunter with just those things. You don't have to have all the bells and whistles. You don't have to have all that stuff, but it does make it easier. And you know there is an advantage to having those things. So I just remembered we have on our website, and I'll share it as well. Uh, are you all seeing this right now? Yeah. What I'm sharing. Yep. Uh, the was it gear up and, and get out uh, uh, for for we've got it for deer season and this one's for for turkey season as well. I'll share the link to that in the chat. Uh, a checklist of and you'll see they've got it broken down into things you have to have um, clothing and firearms and they've got some other gear in there as well. So thank you, Kenton. No problem. Okay, I'll go ahead, Becky. Oh, I was just going to expand for just a second and say that when I started turkey hunting, I just had my deer camo, which is 95% hand-me-downs from my dad and my grandfather. And I had my firearm and my ammo and that was it. But those are so, I look back now and think about those hunts and just, you smile, you had, I had so much fun learning along the way. And I did the same thing that Kenton said he did. And I, I waited to buy things until I knew I was really going to love it. And um, then I started wanting to stay out in the field longer. So I got me a chair to sit on instead of just sitting on the ground. So um, yeah, just wait and see what you like. And then um, I wound up liking a uh, specific kind of call the wing bone call more than anything else and those aren't really that cheap so um i waited a long time to buy one of those um but yeah you don't have to have tons and tons and tons of stuff um or you can if you're like a, a gear junkie you can get it all if you want to <laughs> okay very good let's see uh, speaking of, of gear junkie, uh, someone mentioned, don't forget toilet paper. Uh, very important. Snacks, water, right? Uh, all the, all the creature comforts, no pun intended. Go ahead, Becky. Yes, snacks. That's all I wanted to say. <laughs> if I don't eat, I don't hunt. I gotta eat. <laughs> I carry a cooler with me into the field, regardless of what I'm hunting. Uh, okay, that was very good. Uh, we have one question about a replacement hunter ed card. Um, you can go on our website. In fact, I will, I'll share that. Nah, well, it, it's, it's on our website, go to hunter education. You'll see where you can reprint a hunter education card. And yes, a couple of guys mentioned that if you're born before 1975, which would put you at 46 or older, you don't have to have hunter education in the state of Kentucky. Or if you're hunting on your own property, if you are the landowner, the landowner spouse, or the landowner's dependent children, you do not have to have a license to hunt on your on that property, and therefore do not also do not have to have hunter education if you are license exempt on that property. You go hunt on somebody else's property, you got to have the hunter ed. So anybody else, drop it in the chat if you've got any questions before we go. It looked like there was one. Randy noticed that Kenton had a light on one oh. of his shotguns and wanted to know why. So this is actually not a light. This is, uh, it's called a shot cam. And what it is, is it's a video camera that, that basically will record when I shoot. And so it does look like a light and I could see how somebody would think it's a light, but it's actually a video camera that uh, is on my shotgun so I can, uh, you know, hopefully capture myself uh, harvesting a turkey this year. So that's what that is. It's actually not a lie because, you know, it would be highly illegal to turkey hunt at night. So yeah, that's a video camera. Definitely not something you need. I'm a gear junkie. It's something that I got. I, you know, thought it would be cool. And, you know, same goes with the sights and stuff like that. You don't have to have all those things, so. And I didn't see any more questions, but one thing did cross my mind, Brent, if I can take a second. I mentioned having your license. I mentioned having your Hunter Orange card. 
and your harvest log. Um, we're not diving into laws and regulations on this webinar because um, there's going to be a time for that later. But don't forget that you need a permit for your spring turkeys, or if you're going to hunt in the fall, you need your fall permit. So I just wanted to say that before we wrapped up. I would be remiss to mention that if you are trying to save money and if you do feel like you're going to hunt multiple species and go fishing this year, that eventually you do save money by getting the sportsman's license. Uh, I, I've for years bought it one thing at a time, going to buy one permit at a time, not going to spend all that money. And then every year I end up spending more than I would have on a sportsman's license. So um, if you think you're going to get out there and hunt multiple species and go fishing, go ahead and, and and, and do the sportsman's license. In the end, it will save you money. A um, couple more questions here. Will a full choke work or does it need to be a turkey choke? No, a full choke will absolutely work. Um, like I said, some guns don't even have interchangeable chokes. I actually have an old uh, uh, Browning semi-auto shotgun. They didn't have interchangeable chokes back then. So it's a fixed full choke barrel. Now, the big thing is you can absolutely get away with a full choke. But that's where patterning definitely comes into play because you know that the constriction on that full choke is not going to be as tight as an extra full turkey choke. So you'll need to pattern that gun to kind of get your maximum range. And something I forgot to mention earlier, um, it's subjective as to how many pellets you want to have like in your 10 inch circle. But, um, you know, I've heard people say that, you know, you want to have 20, 20 pellets in a 10 inch circle. And that's like your max range or, you know, I've heard people say less or more, you know, whatever that is, but you just want to, what I would do is like, you could take your fist and like put it in the middle of that pattern. And if you, if you, you know, anywhere you put your fist inside the 10 inch circle, if you had pellets that would hit that, your fist, you're, you're, you would probably be able to kill a turkey with that, but you just want to make sure that you have a good density of those pellets so that you can uh, humanely harvest uh, a turkey if you do get the, the opportunity. Very good. Very good. I see another question or another statement. Uh, it's a good point. Um, we haven't, we haven't mentioned muzzleloaders once and uh, it is, well, I'll let you guys expand on that, but I mean, uh, Tina would be very disappointed in you, Becky. Uh, go ahead. She would. Uh, Kenton, I saw you had a thought too, but yes, it's just not something that uh, we typically talk about for a beginner's course, but yeah, right on Rick out there slaying turkeys with a muzzleloader. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say the same thing you said, Becky. It's like, you know, I don't generally think of a uh, beginner as somebody who would venture out with a muzzleloading shotgun to try that. But I mean, it definitely is legal. Um, you know, I, people have a lot of success with it, but uh, it is kind of a more advanced tactic, I would say, because there's a lot more that goes into muzzleloading rather than just loading a shell into a shotgun. So that's kind of my thought. If you happen to have a muzzleloading shotgun at the house and not any other kind of shotgun, want to give it a try? That's a, a you know another good you know we're all about using what you have, right? So, um, anybody else before we jump off? Becky and Kenton, you guys have been fantastic, absolutely fantastic. I have learned so much. Can't wait to get out there and try it myself. Um, Becky, and uh, thank you specifically for um coordinating all this uh you've done a heck of a job putting all this together uh kenton thank you for volunteering your time becky and i are both getting paid right now but you sir are uh, you're the true hero here we appreciate that a lot and you folks thank you all for for spending this this thursday evening with us um we as becky mentioned earlier we have had some te technical difficulties with the youtube live stream i don't know what happened at some point um kenton was talking he broke it it's my my story i'm sticking to it um the the youtube live stream stopped i don't know what happened uh thankfully though i have been recording the zoom um uh, the entire time so we'll have to try to it is possible to upload a video from zoom to youtube after the fact gonna have to do some playing with that but we'll, we'll try to get this back up on youtube to where everybody can watch it again and review everything because we've thrown a lot of information at you guys <laughs> i'd rather they've thrown a lot of information at us tonight and I'm wishing I was taking notes now right uh, but this has been fantastic 
make sure, please, 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 that you fill out the survey that I'm going to send you tomorrow. Let us know how we did. Let us know what a good job Becky and Kenton did, what a horrible job I did. It all helps us improve uh, for the future. And uh, again, thank you all very, very much. And make sure you tune in again next week. Becky, it is when? It's the 30th. It'll be the last webinar, but you definitely don't want to miss it. We're going to be talking about hunting tactics and scouting. So valuable right before the season kicks off. So the 30th, a um, little bit of a time change. It'll be at 6 o'clock, not 6.30, 6 o'clock Eastern time. Um, yeah, we'll send you an email to remind you. Thank you, Becky. And thank you again, Kenton and everybody. Have a wonderful evening. We'll see you next week.